Mesdames, Messieurs, traditional welcome, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to uh, be acting as moderator for this uh, final session. Um, and uh, it is, as you have just uh, seen on the screen, this identity and social issues, identifying, interpreting and transmitting. Uh, and it falls under the, uh, the theme uh, for uh, a reflective uh, heritage for a resilient society. Um, in a moment, I'm just going to introduce uh, my fellow panellists. Um, but before I do that, um, I will just say one or two, very short, one or two words. Um, and uh, then I think we may have time for uh, some interesting discussion. I hope we will at the end. I'm Neil Forbes. I'm a professor of international history at Coventry University in the UK. Coventry is in the English West Midlands. Um, I'm also director of an institute for creative cultures. And, and I thought that French bureaucracy was bad, but um, uh, having just set up the, this new institute at my university, uh, I understand I actually need the Secretary of State to give me permission to call it an institute. Um, so what I'm going to be letting myself in for as director, I don't know. Answerable to the ministry uh, is the new, new concept. But anyway, um, let me just say then very briefly that um, I sit on the scientific advisory board for the JPI Cultural Heritage. So it's me that my uh, fellow panellists have to blame for inviting them here uh, along with colleagues um, in the Secretariat uh, for, this, for this conference. Um, the theme, re Reflective Heritage for a Resilient Society, as we heard this morning, um, set by the JPI. When, when we were consulting on this and when we were all thinking about this, I don't think in terms of resilience we had war in mind. So it is in that context that I hope I will have some time to just say a few words after listening to what my panellists uh, have to say. Um, but clearly what we do know is that there is a great deal of heterogeneity, complexity, plurality and diversity in society uh, to which we must give credence, we must listen to, we must engage with different communities, diverse communities. Uh, and we must, in our management of cultural heritage, we must ensure that voice is given to those communities uh, and uh, that we engage in effective co-creation and co-production uh, of our cultural heritage. So I'm not going to say any more at the moment, so let me just introduce in the order in which they're going to speak my panellists. Uh, we have Inga uh, Berkland, who's Professor in Human Geography at the University of South East Norway. Uh, Inga is talking on world heritage and the challenges of multifocality. Maya Gori is a researcher at the Institute of Heritage Science at the National Research uh, 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 Centre uh, in Italy. And Maya is speaking on what does sustainable heritage mean, the lessons learned from Western Balkan archaeology. And Herzog. Uh, is lecturer in geography at CY Sergi uh, Paris, Paris University uh, and will be speaking on war heritage in Greece and France, discussing negative heritage for the future. And Valérie uh, Tessier is director of La Contemporaine, Contemporaine uh, uh, Paris uh, Nanterre University and I think you're also a professor of history as, as well at, uh, uh, at, uh, at Paris Nanterre. Speaking on l'Atelier de l'Histoire, uh, a new museum in uh, Paris Nanterre. So um, we're going to try and keep to, to time. So I'll ask my speakers to uh, try and observe 10 minutes each. So we start with, with, with Inga. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Okay, now you can hear me. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for the invitation to present at this important event. Um, at University of Southeastern Norway, we have developed new research and capacity building in relation to the post-industrial region of Rukan and Notodden. In 2015, the area was enlisted as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. I have two aims uh, with the presentation. I will 
talk about some inherent dilemmas and challenges regarding complexity and inclusive social development. And I will propose multivocality as a key concept for heritage research, for improving practices and policies for cultural heritage management. First, a small glimpse of this World Heritage Site. Where are we? We are in southern Norway, in north of Europe. The geographical area is quite large, covering many objects of the built landscape. 92 kilometer long and highly complex, comprising 97, 97 significant objects, spanning across three municipalities and reaching across a population of 22,000 inhabitants. Rukan and Notodden expresses values associated with the second industrial revolution based in hydroelectric power production industry, transport system and its urban communities. Company Norsk Hydro started large-scale production of chemical saltpeter, artificial fertilizer, which was important for the world's agriculture at the beginning of the 20th century. The area experienced quick growth and after a long period of deindustrialization, in particular after 1945. The enlisting is important for facilitating new growth. Uh, in particular, we can see a positive shift for uh, cultural identity related to memories of industrial work. What we still have are redundant structures, buildings and so on, quite dead objects. This shift brings dilemmas and challenges which ask for new solutions. Many European experts have frequently pointed out that industrial heritage is a paradoxical phenomenon, how we in Europe talk about industrial heritage. It's very often not valued as cultural heritage compared to the rich and obvious grand history of European civilization. It has been argued that EU and Europe has not really acknowledged its own modern industrial heritage as cultural heritage. So what do we do when we now are to view cultural heritage not as a cost, but as a resource for Europe? How can our industrial history be transformed into a resource for social and economic development? The first dilemma, on the worm side, industrial development has been crucial for Europe and her position in the world. It has provided economy, history and identity. Industry is Europe. On the other side, the whole of Europe has seen industrial decline. The challenge is to create a future in a context of economic fragility, job loss and out-migration. As industrial work is present at memory, not work, we have a growing population of young people who do not know industrial work firsthand. Communicating with young people is important here. Recognizing the need for broader and deeper communication across generations, a World Heritage curriculum has been developed for Rukan and Utodden. This is implemented in public kindergartens, primary and secondary schools, and new research is being undertaken to analyze its implementation. The second dilemma, white coal hydroelectricity was crucial for development with huge economic and democratic benefits. Industrialization has created benefits, but also costs. And these costs are unsustainable development and global warming. We have a challenge in narrating the values of industrial heritage with a framing that includes Anthropocene futures. How to tell the story of the heritage values of the second industrial revolution in light of global warming? As I and many others have argued, promises of conservation are looking increasingly unsustainable given the reality of Anthropocene. This is important to address as industrial heritage technically consists of man-made remains in the industrial <coughs> landscape. We need clearly to take into consideration the voice of the more than human. Third dilemma. Industrial heritage refers to so much more than objects. We have a difficult dilemma. We have people living in the midst of OUVs. These objects 
are part of home places and people's environments. They are everyday landscapes. They are not the experts' landscapes, but everybody's landscape. And the dilemma extends much farther, of course, because the objects and its landscapes are the heritage of the whole world. They belong to us all. The values exist because of an assumed symmetry between local and universal values. During the 2000s, there was an understanding that traditional top-down policies had failed, while new bottom-up strategies developed, in particular at a local and regional level. We have seen a sea change in the approach to inscription and management of World Heritage Sites. The list of stakeholders have expanded. Communities, local people are crucial stakeholders. What is really positive for Rukanotom is that there exists such communication hands-on and with bottom-up activities. Um, there is local interest and participation. What is still a challenge, we think, is developing better communication platforms, arenas for cooperation between practitioners, uh, management and research. This takes time and costs money. In this sense, there's much to learn by looking more closely at the local management systems. And now to the important concept of multivocality. The concept of multivocality is relevant to analyze issues like placemaking, identity formation, ownership feelings, long time conservation, intergenerational equity, cultural sustainability, democratization, and framing values in relation to global warming. Voice is a good metaphor for working reflexively with inclusion because voices are markers of identity and difference from A to Z. But we have a crisis of voice, a politicization and positionality intrinsic to voice, which must not be forgotten. And it is especially important now not to romanticize multivocality, that giving voice is just easy. The ongoing war in Ukraine is a horrific example. The crisis of voice exists across political, economic and cultural domains. And what we need is thinking deeper and more widely about multivocality. In archaeology, Ayn Hodder has argued for a deeper multivocality. To have more voices participate involves more than allowing voice. We also need to change practices and context. It's an ethical question and a political one. The problem is to have voice influencing and changing discussions and practices. We know that industrial heritage values are replicants of Eurocentric and Enlightenment values. And we also know that these values build upon anthropocentric, human-centric views of nature and the nature-culture divide, which I think is the central challenge for modern society's green transition. We must further the work to treat heritage, natural and cultural as one, as people and place related processes. So we ask of cultural heritage research for the future to engage more deeply and widely with multivocality, to enter the great conversation. What is it that we really want to preserve and why are we doing it? Maybe we should and must shift from preserving objects to preserving processes processes of life, meaning-making, conditions for peace, for living well together, for sustainable development. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Inge. Thank you. And now we pass on to... Uh, oh, sorry. Thank you. Well, I think that you are hearing me, yes. Uh, so I'm very happy to be here with, with you and to participate to this very interesting panel. Um, and today I'm going to provide an example uh, taken from uh, so my, my work. Indeed, I am a prehistoric archaeologist working in the Balkans since 20 years. 
And uh, the lesson I've learned uh, working both in the field of cultural heritage and identity related issues and uh, in the field of being at the forefront of producing past narrative as an archaeologist. So, um, sorry. Okay, yes. So, um, I think that uh, Western Balkans, in this case, uh, what is known as former Yugoslavia, is quite an interesting example to test different type of approaches to cultural heritage and archaeological heritage for three main reasons. The first one is because in a relatively short period of time, we can see how different political frameworks are also making use or producing different type of approaches to cultural heritage and archaeological heritage. The second is that, of course, as you all remember, um, during the 90s war, of course, uh, uh, the use of heritage uh, was paired with political claims. So the, the war made abundant use of destruction and use of, uh, of archaeological and cultural heritage. And third, because many of the small archaeological projects uh, after the 90s were um, using cultural heritage and archaeological heritage as a, um, in, in a abstract positive value as mean to foster peacekeeping and uh, most of those projects actually resu resulted in a completely opposite type of archaeological uh, uh, identity narratives. Um, so, uh, what is uh, important to underline is that during the 90s conflict, uh, the past was not so the destruction of cultural heritage was not what is called a collateral damage. On the contrary, cultural heritage was an explicit target. Heritage was destructed uh, in the framework also of ethnic cleansing and other uh, war practices. We have uh, uh, some uh, iconic uh, figures, uh, so pictures of uh, monuments burned to the ground, like the Sarajevo city hall, and example of reconstruction, and uh, also the type of identity that was attached to the reconstruction. Here, for example, the Sarajevo city hall of Vyachnitsa, which was hosting the National Library, after the reconstruction is changed the function and actually is uh, um, became a sort of landmark of identity which excludes a part of uh, Bosnian society, reflecting what is called the homogeneous segregation of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Another very uh, famous uh, um, example is in Banja Luka, the Ferrat Pasha Mosque, which was uh, uh, shelled by, um, uh, by, by Bosnian Serbs in 1993 uh, uh, sorry, and rebuilt uh, finally in 2016, uh, which uh, represent uh, uh, heritage, of course, focusing on uh, uh, religious identity. And uh, when it was open again to, uh, to the cult, uh, um, it was also attacked uh, uh, by group of uh, orthodox. So uh, even though uh, this is a world heritage of universal value, its reconstruction was connected to a reaffirming of identity after the conflict. I'm just remembering that in Banja Luka, uh, about uh, uh, one tenth of uh, um, the, the people of the Muslim uh, background uh, survived. Um, so um, in this, we can put also archaeological heritage, a far remote past, which was believed to be somehow much more neutral, also in the footsteps of what was the Bronze Age campaign uh, started by uh, so Europe, so fostering a far remote past, uh, maybe is less sensible and maybe we can build some sort of identities. On the other hand, this was resulting in the same type of national identity narrative, but just projecting far more back into the past. So the question is, uh, um, is it the approach that is somehow um, needs to be revised, or uh, is enough just to go back in the far remote past until the Paleolithic and trying to see a sort of neutral ground? Is there a neutral ground for heritage, for identity, especially when this is framed within uh, nation state and a new state identity. Uh, the importance of archaeology uh, is very evident uh, also in the, so in the Presta Agreement, which was just signed, and um, 
Thanks to this agreement, uh, the region was stabilized after 25 years of controversies because of the name Macedonia and the appropriation of cultural heritage. And when I see the role that archaeology has in this agreement, I cannot think of anything uh, uh, more opposite than the concept of multivocality we just heard about. So completely the opposite. So uh, there is one truth, there is one um, nation state that has the right to a past and another that has not right to a past. Um, uh, last but not least, so what I learned from Western Balkan archaeology. Uh, first of all, uh, okay, the, the problem is quite complicated and complex uh, and we uh, we, we started from an approach focusing on dictatorship, nation state, and so on, with much more nuanced understanding of it. So that's, uh, I think it, we are making some progress. But again, uh, when I'm thinking about uh, the present, uh, I'm just leaving you with uh, uh, the mighty profile of the Vincia settlement, which was one of the wonderful Neolithic site uh, discovered at the end of the 19th century uh, by uh, Vasic, who was there uh, and was convinced that in pure cultural fashion of the 19th century, this was the, um, deriving so that the magnificence of the, the historical remains that found was deriving from Greece. So he was the intellectual of the time, he embedded the, the cultural values of the time, which was a filial and uh, um, last but the last remark before uh, leaving uh, the, the stage to my colleagues is I'm just reminding you of the so-called third law of archaeology that says that the future is always immutable, but the past is always changing, it's changing uh, according to present perception of identities, and it will change again in their scientific and not scientific interpretations. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. So now we will now we will hear from Anne. Thank you very much, Anne. So this is an exploration that's part of my research. par le professeur et historien Stéphane Michelot. Pardon, ça va mieux. Oui. Um, donc, OK, sorry. My microphone wasn't on. So my research uh, works uh, on the work of Stéphane Michelot on runes and runes as an artifact and then how to patrimonialize uh, uh, war heritage uh, in France and beyond in Europe. Uh, nationalism is rising again, which means that uh, the heritage sites that are linked to war, of course, are a challenge. So the idea of our exploratory research is focused on something that is not very well known. It's a, a Greek war museum and trying to see their place in Greek uh, current society and beyond in Europe. Um, of course, it's considered to be uh, as a negative heritage. It's something that has been known, um, for instance, in 2002, Leon Meskert. On peut citer aussi l'anthropologue Trina Tricot in 2013. Conflict, trauma and disaster. Mais je... But I find it very inspiring, very interesting. Uh, Sophie Benish, who's a French historian in 2011 and 2013, uses the term negative heritage for Auschwitz. And to say that negative has to be um, looked at, how it traces destruction, Shoah, death, slavery, making this negative part of heritage, it means not looking at things, rejecting a human conscious um, and trying to really understand human cruelty. So what negative negativity, what tra trauma is 
uh, exhibited in these museums. So they were the two world wars that are a large part in Greek. It's not just um, just talking about the war. That's not the reason why it's made negative or trauma. It's usually about heroes and glorious resistance against enemies. It's usually shown in a very positive way in those two war museums. But the reason why we talk about negative heritage is because of the dictatorship. It's not because they were created during dictatorship periods in Greece. It's because the the most recent museum reproduce a, a model of museum that was created during the 1960s and the 1970s during the dictatorship periods in Greece. So they saw the, of, sort of a common language uh, in war museums in dictatorship throughout the world. Usually nothing is said during this history and nothing is said in those museums. It's, so. It needs to be a critical look at what can be called negative in these museums and in these societies. So you see here in the different documents that I'm going to show you, that we're going to go through this very quickly. You will see that these uh, military museum, ha there are two um, periods, main periods, the authoritarian regimes and something much more recent, 1990s and 2000s, where the political and geopolitical uh, context was completely different, Greeks being part of the European Union. So the museum I'm talking about uh, uh, have, are mainly are in two uh, main areas. First, in the capital, or spread out uh, throughout the country, but mainly in the border region, in the northern regions, in the regions where there's a threat that still is felt. Um, so the museography that we studied through a multi-site approach uh, led to the following conclusions. Most most of these uh, museums are um, uh, managed by army, and the exhibits, the whole discourse is about military history. Uh, you, uh, usually, their museology is characterized by the very strong presence of uh, items, of objects, sometimes an accumulation of objects, and usually it, it puts, uh, it stresses uh, victories, military successes uh, in trying to, with the idea of commemorating. What is noticed is that there is nothing about the violence, suffering, nothing about the number of victims, no, no no testimonies about suffering, and everything is uh, um, about uh, you know shiny uh, weapons, uh, uniforms. It's it's sort of a, um, a patriotic, uh, Hellenistic uh, shrine, uh, and of course uh, the uh, enemy uh, is always uh, present. Uh, in both kind of museums, the one for First and Second World War, it's all about uh, the um, military prowess, uh, how valiant they were in Athens, for instance. Uh, it's um, basically how you could sum them up. Uh, so uh, usually the model is very militarized, very centralized. There is a an official vision that it's influenced by the army and, of course, is directly or indirectly controlled by the army. Let's s uh, underline two things. Things. They do not change. They protect and they transmit a model that's been inherited generation and generation. Even newer museum continue with the same militarized model. So the military control is direct or indirect sometimes um, because, because there are partnerships, for instance, uh, uh, even if there are civil institutions, there are partnerships with the military. And sometimes they talk about something much older, about the independence, for instance. There is um, a museum about that that opened recently. And of course, uh, the in Greece, uh, since uh, the 1980s or 1990s, and generally in Europe, uh, museums are created different different way, where trauma, negative parts, has completely renewed museums. Sometimes there were upheavals. They were like 
cutting uh, something completely different, uh, a cut between a period. Uh, for instance, uh, the, histor the history of Perron and Francis would be a good example of that. Uh, so, of course, this great, huge upheaval about heritage uh, players have to expose violence, something that is dissonant. It's a challenge politically, sociologically, for very different reasons. Uh, so, of course, this has very deeply changed these last years in France. Uh, it's a shared memory to um, help construct European identity or for cultural, uh, territorial, or touristic reasons. Uh, so, uh, in this context of constant change in museums, the military museums in Greece seem to be a relic, something much ancient, but still find their place in presence. Someone, for instance, wrote about their stability, um, that it's not open, it's some sort of something that cannot be touched, something that cannot be modified. Uh, and somehow it's so, it, it, it links to the work of recent sociologists about the militarization of Greek society. It's one uh, of the last countries in, the, in Europe where there's still military service. It's a, a country that is still at war with its secular enemy, uh, Turk enemy. So the def defense um, idea is still very present. So this model that means that there is a huge ownership by population. It's sort of a, something you do with school, but the public, the audience is very low, especially in the north. Those museums are not studied very much. So keeping this model by the military institution that wants to protect, that wants to preserve, but also transmit its ideology seems to be at odds with civil society's expectations in the current Greek context, as Kostas Kostis said there is a collective uh, forgetfulness about the war and because uh, the conflict was very traumatizing for the country and um, so it creates a sort of fraction in society that makes it impossible for the whole countries to come together about this idea so uh, since the beginning of the 2000 uh, the, the debate is a part of um, the that are not talked about in the museum the civil war between 1946 and 1949 is something that museums in military museums in Greek do not talk about at all and then the uh, the um, uh, between uh, the 1930s and the 1970s uh, the experience of of opponents of dissidents is not something that is not talked about, uh, which means that uh, there is very strong, stark division in society in its relationship to nation. In the beginning of the 2000s, the left came back to power, and especially in 2015 and the uh, rise of C the Syriza party, there is more political repression through jail, through internment camps, and we'll see islands with exile and uh, um, communism, this patrimonialism is at, at times five, but the paradigm is quite different. It's sort of a negative in spaces that are separate. It's separate from the military, typical military museum. It's sort of like on the fringe of the museum system. Uh, another example of this, of the emergence of new forms of uh, patrimonialization of negative is uh, um, interest, growing interest in Murtara's villages. The example of Distomo uh, were new ways of creating a heritage that really stresses the victims and in particular the civil victims. So I'm going to conclude by saying that the Greek uh, example and the negative heritage for the future, what does it mean? What kind of questions, what does it raise? Well, this case shows that it's very difficult to qualify between what is positive and what is negative. The, the Greek case shows that uh, the circulation of models and standards that are globalized uh, that do not um, make a national and past and hegemonic kind of examples disappear, and which maybe is in contradiction with certain European values. What this case also shows is, is that in this context, the question can be raised is how uh, do they link to uh, military heritage in Greece
case, but also in Europe in terms of practices and way of narrating the subject. And finally, the transition is an issue because they seem to be untouchable, something that was uh, created at the time of uh, repressive authoritarian regimes. It's so there is a question about how a, a negative heritage is transmitted, which means that it's a question for all societies, not just in European societies, not in Greek. So all of this means that all of this is a very topical, con contemporary kind of issues. The role of UNESCO is very important, uh, uh, acknowledging uh, European sites uh, since um, uh, when they rejected the two, uh, the two um, funerary sites and the uh, D-Day landing uh, sites were rejected. UNESCO has uh, reflected on this issue in the last report report in 2020 says that, that uh, uh, it's impossible to um, uh, recognize, to acknowledge these sites to, in the world heritage. So for us, it is a question. It raises the issue, is an issue of scale. What is it? Uh, the community that can think about that, how can we work on the European dimension? And of course, all these questions is, of course, quite topical in the current context. Thank you very much. So our final speaker is Valerie. Thank you, Valerie. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Je vais intervenir en français. Sorry, I'm going to be speaking in French, but of course I can uh, I can answer in English to any question if that proves necessary. So we're going to make a, a quick of a sidestep because up to this point we've been talking about identity issues and now we're going to be turning our minds to societal matters because what I want to show you it's nothing to do with a history museum a memorial national local history these are international collections that have been attached to a, a particular university uh, in the first war so this university uh, association is very interesting. It's a way of trying to provide some sort of space that would make it possible to think about the status of contemporary historical sources and trying to compare different historical periods and contrasting and comparing. All right, then, so very swiftly, this institution is not very well known before it was called the Museum of the World War, and the second, the Documentary Center for uh, this war. It's a private collection, as, or, as is often the case, and uh, has documented this uh, war without precedent in all languages, in all media, um, without any prioritization or hierarchy. It's got press clippings, it's got artwork, it's got uh, propagandic material, uh, posters, objects, and of course, audiovisual uh, components. This was given to the state in, in 1918, the French state that is, and it's still being fed into even today because <laughs> we've got uh, 4.5 million documents that can be, uh, which is a sizable amount, as you can say, many uh, deposits at the National uh, Center for Art, Plastic Arts, lots of private donations, and major themes as well, contemporary history, international history, that is. But first and foremost, conflicts, migrations, exiles, social displacements, uh, movements, trends and human rights 20th to and 21st century. Now, it's, it's connected to uh, this university, Nanterre, with three historians right at the beginning, Camille Bloch and then uh, Mr. Renouvin, Pierre Renouvin. He was, uh, he had been wounded in the war, who prompted international movement starting in France. We've got René Raymond, a big contemporary history figure. And then we have our project, 
of course, things were scattered. There was a museum on one side and the library on the other um, campus. And so we brought everything together. And the project started 25 years back, admittedly. But it's uh, it became more tangible when we could put together this building that opened its doors on October 2021 and designed by the architect Bruno Goda. All right, let me move on. So it's an interesting concept because we have a library here, we have an archive center and a museum. So three ingredients that are intimately linked. It's the place, of course, is open to everybody. Uh, in the ground floor, we have the uh, the reading room, and uh, on the first floor, the history workshop area, and of course, uh, training centres. And that's really what it's all about: training students in a university museum laboratory, and make sure that we have mediators, therefore, that can interact, impactful mediators. It, that can interact with the, the general public. So it's very interesting that it's backed onto a university. It gives, it lends this project some impact. And also it's associated to research work because we have lots of uh, digital humanities programs, uh, lots of action research programs, and then participatory sciences, um, which may sound a buzzword, but it's very hands-on with us. So. They're thinking sitting behind this approach, more than approach, in fact, because it's up and running, it's off the ground. <laughs> we have to think about contemporary usages of history. And what, what are these? Well, much is made of a heritage, but we didn't want to start with that first off when this institution was founded. We want to look at, at, at documents, documents to, to write history, the pages of history, had to think about cultural heritage, and cultural heritage was pushed to the wayside in the day, and maybe has stayed the same. So we've got lots of documents put on the same plane, if you will. Of course, things have changed, usages have changed, and now we're approaching what our colleague mentioned earlier on, a multiplicity of approaches. So we've got culture in there, we've got collective memory, Today, uh, usages are um, one seeking truth and justice, particularly for Spain. Uh, we can think about uh, uh, dictatorships in, in Mediterranean, what have you. So understanding this complexity and having people understand it. So we have this uh, history workshop, therefore, which lays much emphasis on this collective process interaction between the various levels within society. We've got historians, we've got archivists, we've also got, of course, uh, people who've got personal accounts of, of phases of history. You know, what could have this status as a source? Right, so we've got these Zadkin um, pictures, we can zoom in on them. But, of course, that has different dimensions to it. We've got an artist who's done this in the 1418th War in the trenches, that intended for his um, for collector, collect, collectors, painters, galleries, but also for his inner circle. There's also a testimonial uh, that can be interconnected with other uh, corpuses of, of historical material and with potential for comparing and contrasting. So with this reflexive approach for this uh, history workshop, this begs the question, why would you become interested in artifacts that drew little attention beforehand? How does a document move from an information-based source to that of an uh, uh, historical archive. Why do you want to hand on something to future generations? And why uh, do we want to write history using all these components and to the benefit of society as a whole and be part of this process? So as I said, the people that are evolving around this uh, is, uh, would say that these sources, these statuses, if you will, are part and parcel of a consensus among stakeholders, uh, citizens, people involved in the events, researchers, architects, uh, ar archivists, rather, and uh, librarians. Let's get back to the process then. Let's look at the, the artifacts of the, of the First World War. We've got these, uh, these tracts, if you like, propagandic material in those tubes. 
that were launched into enemy territory. Now, these objects, let's say, that have come down the ages to us, are they souvenirs? Do they bear witness to a, pers a collector's curiosity or that of a historian who says to himself all of a sudden, look, these are sources that will help us better understand something else about propaganda and about the material medium for disseminating propaganda uh, alongside other documents that are featuring here. We've got uh, paper, uh, newspaper material. We've got censorship read, uh, record books, log books that in those days were thrown away. But these have survived. So these sources, a long time, left to one side. But we've got other sources. Now, uh, it's been cropped, this picture. It's a bit of a shame. But on the left, we've got a wonderful crystal object. This is an object that was uh, given as a tribute to Marshal Peytan and the Vichy government. And oh, that's what you see a, a bit of it on the left. It's pictures being cropped. But anyway, this um, here, here we see objects that have been distributed by the Pétain, by uh, Maréchal Pétain, but they were swept under a carpet, and nobody wanted to see them. It was this <clears throat> past that nobody wanted to look at. So this has been in the oubliette for decades, and now we're looking at them differently because historiographical research that's more multidisciplinary have, have, have looked at these objects to yield a multiplicity of different representations. Another point here, we've got um, the school books of 1920s. Now, these were things that were, uh, were asked to be done by a rector George Lyon, a person who was very much involved in the uh, Great War and was very much on the ground with the people in the north and asked uh, schoolmasters to get kids to write about their personal accounts of their life during the war. And for decades, this was left to, to one side by archivists, but also by histor historians, archivists because they'd they categorize that as a bit of a strange, weirdo object, something that's not of, of any great value. And the historians left it to one side because they thought that the children's accounts were of, had been dictated to them by adults, so they were of no historical value. But when you look at those sources, you know, tens and tens of years down the road, you can see that it is the insight of these populations that have been displaced during the Great War. And these children are talking about their daily lives, which is eminently relevant. So a phase of a kind of a sedimenta sedimentation process, very interesting. And this sedimentation process has, has changed things in terms of our historical views, in terms of how we can reappropriate the 100th anniversary and historicist view. All right, then here we've got co-construction, artists, citizens, researchers, students, archivists, um, and what have you. These are generally digital, feature uh, in that way. What if, uh, how do we pass them on? We've got the digital spaces, but of course questions are asked now about uh, native uh, digital material, and I'll round off on this point. This museum basically it, it questions the source of history. What can you do to pay testimony and to process and document and to hand on, basically, or shed proper light, instructive light, and to understand with all modern media what uh, all this means and involves? Thank you very much. And thank you to all four panellists for uh, absolutely fascinating uh, papers. I'm just going to very quickly try to, to summarise what I think brings these contributions together. Uh, and then I'm going to pose a question really to, to, to the panellists, but also to, to you, to us all, um, uh, and see if we can, see if we can uh, generate some, uh, some debate on this. I mean, in terms of identity, it seems to me what is absolutely crucial, what is actually sort of the bedrock of what we're talking about, is the issue and the question um, of, of values. When you're talking about identity, it's values. So we heard presentations here this afternoon uh, in terms of industrial heritage, industrial history. Uh, you know, this is, and the, particularly the built environment. I mean, in, in the UK, we are 
busily demolishing uh, coal-fired power stations. I mean, coal, although of course it's politically incorrect at the moment, coal was absolutely the bedrock of industrial, uh, industrial society, industrial heritage, and the impact of that on working lives and memories, absolutely uh, crucial. Uh, we also heard about the tangled and tortured history of the, of the Balkans uh, and the way in which the question was posed, is there a neutral ground? And how do we go about mediation? Uh, the uses and, if you like, the abuses um, of heritage. Uh, uh, dictatorships, uh, as we know, across Europe, uh, particularly, of course, in Greece, but I think it, it, that could apply to, to my knowledge of Spanish, some Spanish uh, museums as, uh, as well. Uh, a certain set of values portrayed there, but it's what is omitted and left out of that representation. Uh, and finally, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the museum, particularly commemorating area, uh, an issue such as the First World War. We know with the anniversary of the 100 years uh, uh, of the war, which we've seen recently, the tremendous uh, outpouring, if you like, from the publics across, uh, across Europe. You mentioned donations, uh, the way in which has really stimulated that kind of collective memory. So it seems to me that values is uh, the, you know, the, the heart of what we're talking about here. But that, that begs the question, does it not? Whose values and how do we negotiate between those values? And it seems to me, uh, and this is the kind of area that I want to be a little bit provocative on, uh, that, that we need to think about how we are going about defending liberal democratic values. We cannot take this for granted. And it seems to me, you know, uh, that, uh, uh, that this doesn't just apply to, the, to, you know, to what is happening uh, to the horrors between uh, Ukraine and Russia. It can apply to our your own European countries as well. Liberal democratic values are under attack. Let's make no mistake from the left and the right in all of our countries. The rise of populism and nationalism is, is a threat which we have completely overlooked uh, in the last few years. We've been distracted by any number of other issues. So my question to the panellists and my question to you is how do we go about being uh, you know, more robust in that? We need to give voice and representation to minority communities and minority voices. Uh, we must respect that because that is, that is essential for, to the defence of liberal democratic values. Uh, how do we at the same time give recognition to main, what you might refer to as mainstream values as well? Because if we don't do that at the same time, we open the door uh, to the populists and the nationalists to say that, uh, that their own you know, uh, values are not being represented. So I'm sorry if I'm being provocative, but let's see what that stimulates. Anyone from the panel or from you uh, uh, in the audience, please. Otherwise, I'll pick on someone. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yes, Inga. Okay, yes. Um, sorry about that. Um, identity values and how do we go about negotiating different values? It's really the issue, I think. Really, really important whose values are to be voiced and heard and to make a difference. Uh, there needs to be. Um, a space for conflicting narratives, uh, definitely. Um, and we have to make space for that. Uh, I work in teacher education and we try to negotiate that every day with our teacher students in social studies. Uh, it's really difficult uh, and very important uh, because young teachers are going to teach the young generations of the future about these values and how to deal with different and conflicting values. Also, I think we need to allow for thinking about change in a more dynamic way. We have a tendency to fix identity values in heritage discourse, and we need to allow for thinking about change as natural as uh, um, um, what exists in nature, what exists in society, we know is change. So how do we go about uh, dealing with change? I think that's very important. Thank you, that's tremendous. Um, uh... Sorry. 
Uh, yes, so I think that the crucial issue connected with values is also um, the ownership of heritage and who has the right to own one heritage and how you can share this heritage. So I made this example of um, the nation states and national narratives that uh, were also built uh, on the material presence of some archaeological remains. And you can just mention the example of Kosovo. Iron Age is embedding like uh, a very specific type of values. So when we would like to understand uh, the, 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 the value, I think uh, that we need, first of all, yes, to uh, acknowledge the notion of change and that there is no direct line between the past and the present, which uh, propose a sort of crystallized identity, which is coming from, I don't know, the Bronze Age, Iron Age to the present day. And also we have to make a sort of effort uh, to promote an inclusive and culturally and socially sustainable heritage. And I saw this in the Balkans, which, okay, it's a very big and huge topic, which I tried to summarize, uh, leaving out many important issues. But I think that also the appropriation, what is my heritage and only my heritage, uh, is one of the crucial issue that we need to face uh, and also to abandon, in my opinion. Um, what I would like to, to add uh, from uh, research uh, on, on war heritage uh, for now maybe 10, 10 years is that uh, really new values are now associated to war heritage making, to new museographies uh, all over Europe and particularly in France, which I know more. Uh, values of peace, reconciliation, very positive uh, values. Uh, but at the same time, these uh, processes have been criticized also, and uh, for example, by political historians or who criticize the fact that uh, it sometimes depolitized uh, the way heritage is showed or mediated. Or So in this area of uh, conflicting war heritage or negative uh, heritage, um, it's, it's really the values are also conflicting very often. And when you, when you ask whose values, yes, this is a, the right question, of course. Uh, and museographies and museums, for me, are also um, these space um, which can be studied to, to illustrate uh, these um, powers games and, um, and between different kinds of stakeholders. And finally, what they show is the capacity of some stakeholders to impose a public discourse, a public narratives, which values or new values or heritage values. And uh, so this is my, um, how social science, for example, uh, um, study. Now, what I think is that there are, there are also uh, very recent research, uh, which are really interesting. For example, uh, the feminist uh, research, um, looking at war heritage. And this is really interesting too, because uh, they show, for example, um, how these museums or these war heritage sites, they reproduce gendered uh, organization or representation uh, of uh, the society at large. And this is also uh, linked to value system. And I think this new or renewed research should also be more developed about uh, how we look at this uh, heritage. Well, about values. Well, what I think that uh, is, we have to explain, explain and explain again the process. For instance, when I spoke uh, about propaganda, while well, some historians uh, tell that uh, propaganda is not a subject, uh, that is uh, an interesting, interesting subject, but it is. When you see um, today the propaganda with the war between Russia and Ukraine, when you see that 100 years before, the same process were present. So it's important for us to, to explain and explain in our museum, in our libraries, that we have a very important mission yes. with education. Thank you very much. Um, any questions and comments? No. Um, in that 
case, I think we, we've probably exhausted our time anyway, and um, we're probably all exhausted from a, a day's conference anyway. So uh, uh, all that remains is for me to just make one public announcement, and that is uh, please remember to bring your pass with you tomorrow, uh, tonight obviously, but also tomorrow uh, for, the, uh, for the session. Uh, I was issued that reminder by, uh, by the backroom staff, and I think I should give particular tribute to the backroom staff. Um, it's invidious to name people, but Clara has been instrumental in getting us all together. So I would thank uh, the uh, JPI Cultural Heritage colleagues for that. Uh, and would you join with me in thanking our panellists for a fascinating session? Thank you.